Okay, so uh, we should get started. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here. I know it's Sunday morning, it's early for everyone, uh, especially for me. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, thank you for being here and I'm very excited about the next paper, so we should move right to it. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Hugo Moreno, professor uh, at Wake College, and I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Hernande, Hernando Estevez. Uh, he teaches uh, in the Department of Philosophy at the John Jay College of the City University of New York, and uh, he received his PhD from DePaul University. Uh, he's, uh, he teaches in the areas of Latin American philosophy, continental philosophy, and uh, uh, social political philosophy, and uh, he has done uh, um, a lot of research in the area of uh, the notion of political identity and uh, uh, how it contributes to the idea of citizens citizenry in uh, 19th century Latin America. And he's currently uh, doing research in uh, the rhetoric of Latin American literature and its relation to uh, the problems of philosophy. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Hernando Estevez. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for um, Alejandro for the invitation and thank you for the University of Oregon for um, hosting this wonderful conference and uh, thanks to all of you for being here this morning. Um, so um, the the title of my paper, um, when I sent it to Alejandro, I sent it both in Spanish and in English. And um, in Spanish is El Desafío a la Corrupción en Latinoamérica. Um, and when I translated that, that title, um, um, I, I, tried to I want to emphasize the El Desafío, the challenge to corruption um, in Latin American politics. Um, my paper um, deals with um, what I consider to be one of the uh, most important problems um, in Latin America, which is corruption. And the way that I will deploy this, pro this, 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 um, this problem, um, it's an attempt to um, try to provide a, a different kind of philosophical base for how to treat the problem of corruption. So um, I'm gonna go through an introduction and then there's three parts of the paper. Um, the last part is a, a proposal on how to best um, not only deal with the problem of, of corruption, but how that Latin American philosophy can respond to that program, to that problem. So I will, um, so the three parts are, um, yeah, so I'll try to do my best to do the whole, to read the whole thing, but if I cannot, then we'll read the third part and then we can discuss that. Okay. Um, well, the American continent symbolizes the extension, reception, assimilation, and rejection of European political virtues and vices. Latin America, Latin America represents the clash of two realities. One belonging to the political domain, Spain, Spanish defeat in 1898 with the United States of America, and the other to the cultural domain, the defense of pre-Columbian values and the production of a new culture afflicted by profound political, social, and economic disruptions. In Latin America, European values are found deeply embedded in the political traditions and they exemplify the effects of a colonial period that continues to define Latin American politics. In that sense, the year of 1898 denotes within the history of the American continent the advent of a geopolitical and cultural distinction that has not yet expired. In that year, the United States of America not only destroyed, destroyed the Spanish fleet in Santiago de Cuba and Cavite and defeated the Spanish empire, it also positioned itself as a new Western empire. The declaration of war to Spain by the United States signified a new political aggression, not only to Spain, but also to the Ibero-American region. North America began to the spreading of its political ideas as early as 1847 with the invasion of Mexico and its strong presence in Central America and the Caribbean. The political strategy in the United States involved the exportation and import imposition of a new version of modern Eurocentrism hidden in the benefits of extreme capitalism and the commercialization of democratic values. However, 1898 also witnessed the ascent of a strong desire by the countries conquered and colonized by Spain in Europe to resist the imperial intention of the United States. 
As a result, democracy in Latin America was installed as a political, economic, and social idea during the transition from subject to citizen, attaining the constitutional establishment and development of a nationalism conducive to the materialization of democratic principles worthy of a political independence that did not necessarily meant the end of colonialism. In his book, 1898, Reconciliation or Disaster, Leopoldo Sea argues that the year of 1898 initiates in Hispanic America a new awareness of its common history to face globalization and its political and social challenges. For Sea, the recognition of a common situation among Latin Americans did not necessarily imply renouncing to particular idiosyncrasies belonging to each country, but it provided the historical consciousness and knowledge of the historical events that could contribute to the creation of a political common space. This common space provided novel answers to inevitable political concerns that came with the changes caused by the shift of political power, both nationally and as well as internationally. According to Thea, the United States' territorial aggression towards Spain acted as a catalyst for the development of intellectual, political, social, and economic ideas in Latin America, which in turn caused Europe to recognize Latin America countries as autonomous regions with the American continent with a common, within the American continent with a common history and identity. After all, former countries, countries under Spanish hegemony were resisting imperial absolutism while demanding equality among citizens, nations, and continents. In this context of cultural and political aggression, the newly formed Hispanic American nations rooted the democratic principles in the midst of resistance and assimilation of values. The con this contradictory political process gave rise to a political and ideological ambivalence that seems, that seems has defined Latin American reality. These views found blunt expression in Jose Enrique Rodó, Rodó's literary and ideological work. In his text Ariel, Rodó recovers from Spanish values who was most loved by the intellectual elite, that is, the capacity to assimilate the historical confluence of all races and cultures and find in the territories of South America an ideal place to resist the norms that would result in an inevitable Nordomania. Nord to resist North America influence meant for Rodeau the universalization of culture and promotion of a pluracial plur plur and plur pluricultural America that could become authentically universal. However, we also found in Ariel a voice that re forewarns the dangers of the that, that the United States could exert on Latin American future. For Rodeau, as well as for Jose Marti, the United States Civilization Project aimed at, aim at deslatinizar non-Anglo Anglo no Anglo-Saxon America and erasing from the South American culture map all indigenous Africans and most importantly, el mestizaje, so as to reamericanizar re the continent. Worried by, worried, worried by these threats, Jose Martí wrote in Nuestra America that the diversity of Latin countries could not be foreign to the notions of race and culture. Race and culture are the fundamental axis that allows resistance in front of imperial arrogance to the multiculturalism and pluralism which oppose, quote, the hegemony over the lands that colonial Spain opened to the world, given that North America is ruled by the imperial principle that claims superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race over the Latin race. Close quote. Latin America intellectuals have to face not only the cultural influence that brought the false belief of superiority, but they also had adapt, have to adapt to the economic model spreading through the continent. These imperial intentions gave rise to a cultural exaltation that still today indirectly guides the future of Latin America by predetermining its political future through the so-called search or, or preservation of our cultural identity. This emphasis on the preservation of cultural identity has become a hindrance for the development of a concrete political identity. I will return to some instances of this and its theoretical consequence later. In the same manner that the work of Jose Martí delineates the strategy for the creation of Latin America upon resisting and rejecting any form of servitude to the demands of North America, Jose Vasconcelos project, The Cosmic Race, aims to contribute to the search of for idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasies guided in part by making the cultural differences and of political values for universality. Although the cultural and political development was defined by the strong desire to accompli accomplish such a task, its consolidation was trunc truncated by the lack of political institutions and policies that would ensure its execution. In other words, the cultural development achieved the, condi 
the cultural development achieved the conditions to accomplish what Gauss has called mental emancipation, but culture has also failed left, but culture has also left the colonial political order intact. In spite of intellectual efforts to resist cultural in in interference, the United States continued to have a major influence in Latin America by virtue of being both the source of political ideas as well as new forms of resistance. However, Jose Marti had already identified in 1891 the greatest of all dangers that come with interference. Quote, when a strong people cheats another, it makes the servant of them, close quote. The answer to the events of 1898 has been the practice of a democracy. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I was too worse to have water. The answer of the events of 1898 and the has been the practice of a democracy with an immense colonial legacy that continues to preserve and perpetuate exclusion in its socio-political and economical framework. This political and economical residue is not an exclusive Latin American phenomenon. However, I would like to argue that it has become a political value, and as such, it has become the determinant element of individual's identity. More than a phenomena, exclusion expressed in terms of an exaggerated subjectivism, subjectivism um, and this is, a, it, this is when translation um, is not, I mean, I, the, the original notion that I thought about about this exaggerated subjectivity was something like a radical, un subjetivismo radical has been a political attitude that governs social relations and creates the ethical standards by which actions are judged. I take this deep-seated subjectivism to be the respond enacted when individuals face inequality and exclusion and convert it into the means of political discourse and practices. This deep-seated subjectivism assumes that political means and practices, particularly those theorized in the relationship among individuals and between individuals and institutions, are the source of processes and that they must be accepted as political. That this phenomenon has rarely seen as such is more a reflection on entrenched definitions of political culture than an indication of the political initiative in or political relevance of cultural politics in Latin America. This subjectivism becomes political when its practice becomes, when its practice becomes the source of processes that seek to redefine the power determining social order. In Latin America, this redefinition is mediated by forms of political actua action intimately related to the construction of particular political identities that undermine the collective power endemic to democra democratic governability. This subjectivism continues to prevail over Latin American political relations and by emphasizing the political ambivalence from resistance to assimilation in the face of foreign influences, it is not difficult to notice that the current Latin American political and economical situation finds its roots in policies directly fundamentally towards inequality and disconnected from personal and institutional morality. The fragmentation of political relationships between individuals and society as a result of the deviation of power forces the individual who suffers of this deep-seated subjectivism to wrongly conceive individual autonomy, transforming power into a political value in pursuit of authority that does not unfold by consensus, nor does it satisfy the value of corrupt cooperation. In other words, individual authority undermines collectivity vis-a-vis -vis the overpowering of individualism by introducing arbitrariness in the social order and making it the base for political relationships. In that sense, the use of arbitrariness in the application of norms makes subjectivism viable through the exuberant individuality which exalts and legitimizes the distortion of the individuals in relationship proper of democra democratic governability. The individual motivations for superimposing individual interests over common interests conveys both an exaggerated use of power and to act contrary to the normative standards practiced by the established social order. This deviation of power by the individual as well as by society is, is for Enrique Dussel the main cause of corruption and that which makes politics bad politics. Bad politics is for Dussel the fetishism of power that corrupts the totality of society by making subjectivism the source and end of political power. Dussel's book, 20 Theses on Politics, highlights the conceptual framework from where it is possible to address the problem of corruption. This conceptual framework of bad politics 
is characterized by this disintegration of the political system that places subjectivism at the center of political order while abandoning any possibility for the development of an intersubjectivity network of multiple relations and functional life modes. The fact that for Dussel also, the fact that for Dussel all subjectivity is simply subjective makes the problem of corruption not just simply a matter of bad policies or an abuse of power, nor a desire for political power, but rather a problem of political representation between the public and private spheres of quality. I suggest that the problem of political representation finds its root on the deep-seated subjectivism that, as I have argued, it responds to the exclusion that still governs Latin American politics. I argue that corrupt practices of citizens in defending themselves against various modes of inequality have made of corruption an essential element of life and a skill that they hone such that its perfection is at times worthy of praise and admiration. The skill defended compromises class interests and struggles and even coverts other forms of exclusion and inequality. While such conflicts may not necessarily result in a structural transformation, the changes they affect in everyday attitudes and norms is part of the dynamics of Latin American politics. However, this ability is shaped, contested, and defended in different domains of power relations. I also argue that it is necessary to reflect upon the role of corruption on other philosophical bases that, does that those that treat corruption as a problem of effectiveness of the judicial structure. To do so, I reach out to the political works of Andres Bello, and especially to his essay, Observance of the Law, to understand why corruption is not simply a matter of judicial effectiveness, but rather the consequence of a subjectivism rule by what call, by what, excuse me, I have to start that sentence again. To do so, I reach out to the political works of Andres Bello and especially to, this, to his essay, Observance of the Law, to understand why corruption is not simply a matter of judicial effectiveness, but rather the consequence of a subjectivism rule by what Bejo calls the principle of arbitrariness. This approach would shift the problem of corruption from its institutional ground to the philosophical need to reconfigure political representation in Latin America by challenging the way subjectivism has been constituted in a democratic political arena that continue to be, to be defined with the exclusivist logic, residue of colonialism that maintains the independence process incomplete. In order to understand corruption in its relation to the formation of subjectivity and the sources of political order, I first revise the concept of universalism in Western tradition and consider the ways in which Latin American post-colonial discourse has not yet fully provided the necessary framework for where the individual in a transmodern perspective makes possible the reconfiguration of its political subjectivity. Political subjectivity in that sense is still driven by the need to reclaim its own space and incorporate the other's gaze as a political subtlety. In other words, there is still an exclusion that is often ignored and only recognized through the appropriation of other's experiences and traditions that contribute to the augmentation of the presence of the narrative itself and not the life and tradition of others. In order to understand political subjectivity outside of some particular location predefined by both provincial particularisms and abstract universalisms, we have to ask how to decolonize the image of Latin America for others and for itself, since postcolonial discourse is still caught up in the resistance assimilation problem of establishing social order in what seems to most Latin Americans to be an unequal society. The point of this discussion is to show that the corruption cannot be abstracted solely as a consequence in the development of good political institutions, nor just judicial procedures. Despite the good intentions of most of its leaders, democratic social order has failed to break out of the structures that preceded it. Finally, I challenge the colonial residue that has preserved in the Latin American individual a political subjectivity that promotes arbitrariness and corrupts politics. This challenge draws from Ames Husser, critique on colonialism, and addresses the recent work on civet culture by Colombian philosopher Antana Smoke. So that's the introduction. Um, first part, the universal in Latin American image. Transcontinental America acknowledges its borders and its social and cultural differences by the fact that each nation has achieved a political ideal. 
However, this recognition throws into focus that most Latin American nations maintain in their political system a tradition of the universal. That is, Latin American political order and governability is marked by the intellectual effort of modernity to develop objective science, universal morality, and law, and autonomous cultural recording to reason. The independence movement and state formation combined with the development of social organization and rational modes of thought have promised liberation from the irrationalist of colonialism and liberty from the arbitrary use of power. Simultaneously, modernity has argued that only through the project of democracy and its doctrines of equality and universal reason could the universal and its eternal qualities be revealed to Latin America. An approach to the role of modernity in Latin America that conjoins the political and the rational with the social and cultural would work best to understand how modernity sought embrace progress and actively sought to charter history and tradition in, the Lat in Latin American for the creation of an image of Latin America that could dissolve all particularities into university, universal. Modernity saw the, perma the permanent, the lasting, and the complete as a necessary condition through which the Enlightenment project could be achieved in Latin America. In spite of the epistemological decentralization that has guided the efforts of postcolonial work through the identification of the colonial structures with greater influence in the region, Eurocentri Eurocentrism and universalism still both have theoretical and practical effects, especially in the exercise of power. Philosophy of liberation, notions of transmodernity, has made clear that the ego constitus has prior to the, was prior to the Cartesian solipsism, and that in spite of having been critiqued by the Western tradition, the epistemological neutrality and empirical objectivity that have produced universal scientific knowledge is still current through the presence of an abstract universal, which has resulted on knowledge produced through the removal of all subjectivity and spatial and temporal determinations subsuming all possible otherness into absolute knowledge. Thank you. The European image of Latin America and the end of the 19th century arises from the influence of this predomin predominant abstract universality from rationalism as the essence of the modern human spirit by placing other cultures and traditions in the peri peri periphery of Western thought. This image authorized in Europe a cultural expansionism transforming Hispanic, Hispanic America into Latin America through a moral reordering of the colonial legacy, legacy. To this end, the Iberian Peninsula placed the conquest and colonialism as the necessary axiological base for the advancements of Western thought. According to Walter Mignolo, quote, during the 19th century, Latin America was named adopted to a lat lat Latin in, in between quotes, Latin America was the name adopted to identify the restoration of Euro European, meridional, Catholic, and Latin civilization in South America, and simultaneously to reproduce absences, Indians and Afros that had already been, already begun um, during the early colonial period. The history of Latin America after independence is the variegated history of the local elite willingly or not, embraced morally, while indigenous, Afro, and mestizo peoples get poorer and more marginalized. The notions of, re of restoration and reproduction are crucial for they represent the most effective processes that have allowed the acceptance of a universal morality justified as necessary. The establishment of a universal political model that could preserve colonial political values in the midst of independence, such as a democracy, a democratic economy, would guarantee the acceptance of Eurocentric morality under the excuse of preserving cultural values. Culture was considered to be the source of political values and a force that fuels the permanent search for an identity from where it would be possible to deploy a field for all political challenges and narratives. In other words, culture also became universalized by strengthening subjectivity in the face of social inequality through the reconfiguration of subjectivism, subjectivism but this time not to fulfill the political needs of new democratic order but rather to fulfill the cultural needs upholding Latin American identity. This reconfiguration was done by situating subjectivity at the center of gravity of nationalism only to dissolve particularities into cultural identity with an abstract universalism that still privileged the European legacy of white feodals over the rest. The dangers of this moral recolonization and the imposition of foreign models, at times economic and at times cultural, Conceal with the demand of an economic values was foreseen by Simon Rodriguez during the initial years of the independence. In his text, Inventamos o Erramos, either we invent or we continue to make mistakes, he announces that, quote, Spanish America demanded two simultaneous revolutions, 
one public or political and another economic. The difficulties of the first one were big. The general Bolivar has overcome them as struggle and has invited others to overcome them. The obstacles that oppose the preoccupations of the second are enormous. The war of independence has not yet reached its end, close quote. The economic revolution of, Sim of which Simon Rodriguez warns us never occurred, but rather the legacy of its evilness has allowed for a different dependency than that of the epistemic universalism, which has placed once more the Latin American individual and his subjectivity in a political ground where the locus of initiation is predetermined by the logic of capitalism. Although this is not the place to engage in a discussion on the effects of on capitalism and democracy, it is the logic of inequality caught up in the practice of capitalism and its values that which brings us directly to the question of equality and its relation to corruption. How are the notions of equality and corruption expressed in the political practice of democracy? A distinction between real corruption and the perception of corruption is now necessary. Corruption is a widespread phenomenon in varying degrees throughout the world with a large or all chronological scope. The differences between countries at times are, however, not only in degree, rather in the social diffusion and in the reaction to corruption from the community. Real corruption makes reference to the concrete judicial context that requires, as Bejo will argue, equal conditions for the law to be observed by all. Bejo's judicial position resides in an exteriority of the logic of democracy that claims the development of individual's moral character, claims that the, excuse me, claims the development of individual's moral character rests within the enforcement of law and punishment. Even, even, um, even it would be possible to procure the conditions for the law to practice within equality, the perception of corruption would still be informed by an internal logic of a capitalist democracy consistent with the residue of exclusion from colonialism. As argued earlier, exclusion promotes the use of arbitrariness, which depends the end, which deepens the undermining of the collective power while it produces a deviation from what the collective considers valuable in the social arena for the sole benefit of whom deviates. Thus, the power of corruption manifests the judicial inefficiency of the institution, and it results from the clash of economic, religious, and traditional values that provoke social instability on the corrupt side. Once a society has considered itself as corrupt, the order promoted by norms no longer can sustain the social order, producing insubordination, fallibility, disagreement, and most importantly, incoherence. Our study of the conditions promoting corruption cannot limit itself not limit itself to identifying the individual causes of corruption of or understanding the power that produces individuals' relations or positions such as dominant class vis-a-vis -vis dominee. For if corruption partakes of power and subjectivity, it is no less urgent to examine how individuals are constituted to self-benefit and to self-interest. Corruption would then be simply the result of a discursive egoism that has been interiorized. So that's the first part. How are we doing with that? Okay, yes. Andres Bello, the observance of the law. Andres Bello's political outlook retakes the notions of democracy and liberty as values for autonomy by furthering Justo Sierra's and Simon Bolivar's claims insofar as it makes of political autonomy the basis for cultural autonomy. In the course of critiquing cultural autonomy, Bejo appeals to the role of legislation to question the manner in which sovereignty is reached when the values of cultural identity surpass those of political identity. To do so, it is to subvert the circumstances belonging to Latin American food reality. Culture for Andres Bejo is the source of legislation, but not the basis for it. The central political axis of a given state shifts the understanding of cultural values, but the task of the constitution should not be the not be balancing the cultural and political powers or establish guarantees and promulgating liberal principles. Rather, it is to, quote, the, to deeply know the kinds of necessities of the people to whom the legislation is applied, close quote. These words of Andres Bejo resonate with the words of Jose Ortega Gasset, called for the need to consider the understanding of the individual or people inseparable from the circumstances. For both Bejo and Ortega Gasset, only a circumstantial Understanding from concrete reality could provide the basis of our historical narrative 
where the beliefs that define the lives of individuals could inform them of their past that in turn would promote political identity. Andres Bello's work, besides arguing for the need to attain knowledge on the of the circumstances in order to have knowledge of the individual's life, life also becomes a method capable of providing cultural autonomy as an essential for social understanding of the cultural deficiency. In this sense, Bello points out that in abolishing the cultural politics distinction, the legislative aspect of the government would place culture in politics, hence give it more reach and legitimization. This last point obviously has the intent of eliciting, eliciting some kind of need for a method of appropriation politics in which individuals no longer have to decide between cultural or po political identity and therefore might begin to resolve the resistance of assimilation that has distorted the establishment of government in Latin America. In the aftermath of independence, Andres Bello provided a comprehensive blueprint for notion, na nation building in Latin America by accentuating legal elements to the need of, for political stability and economic viability. Among the requirements for national unity proposed in his literacy and educational programs, the essay Observance of the Law outlined the essential political and judicial conditions for social order. Although the constitutions of the newly formed republics needed to secure public order and protect the rights of individuals through the elaboration of laws conducive to stability, Bello believed that the improvement of the conditions on which the law operates augments the general understanding of law while increasing its effect effective effectiveness. This emphasis on the political condition suggests that the advancements of political progress demands the dismantling of those colonial structures that continue to hinder the goal of independence, namely inequality. In other words, the practice of law requires the absence of any socio-political grouping that wants to extend and preserve its privilege by feeling above the law while perpetuating social mobility through notions of class and race. Nevertheless, the observance and effectiveness of the law provides the individual with a license to strengthen the limits of freedom essential for social order and imperative for, so for, for preserving and securing the an understanding of the relation between freedom and justice. Conjoining moral and legal notions generates out of the observance of law satisfactory possibilities from whence to recreate a political space thus far denied in which the unequivocal recognition of um, multiple constitutes our social and political specificity will become the basis for what Husserl calls concrete universals. Ultimately, justice in a conjunction in favorable political conditions that assert the value of freedom vis-a-vis -vis others' rights. In Bello's words, quote, can there be greater injustice than a readiness to trample on the rights of others and trying to have one's own rights religiously observed, praising justice when it takes place in someone else's house and detesting and cursing it when one fears it in, his own <coughs> in one's own is an unpardonable sin, but is what we most frequently observe a result of the human heart weakness and corruption, close quote. Much is legitimately at stake in such juxtaposition of political conditions for freedom and justice, as well as in the development of individual moral character. Given that the development of moral character deepens from the individual, recognition of the affinity that must exist between order, other rights, and one's rights, what is at issue with the political space is not only the interaction among citizens, but the concern for of creating political conditions that would not deteriorate individual character and the distort the aim of justice. For Bello, individual condition is characterized by the vicious propensity to escape from the law, especially from, quote, the law that limits absolute freedom and reduces its activities to terms of reason and justice, close quote. Two observations follow from these remarks. The first is that it is the, it is the super superordination of obedience to the law, that which is necessary for developing individual's character. Disobedience takes the form of limiting individual freedom by elevating the moral value of the respect of the law, which in turn, according to Bejo, does not undermine the very basis on which the authority rests. The second observation, which follows from the first, is that it is important to recognize that individuals' character are not necessarily absorbed or dissolved into the demands of justice. Individuals' character must be formed with laws abundant in virtue that could combat, combat human weakness, the cause of corruption, which is defined by Bejo as that which incites irrepressible individual self-interest and complete disregard for the rights of others. So for Bejo, corruption is both behavior that deviates from formal duties of a public role because of private gain 
but also the perception of the law created by corrupted behavior. Beggio extends the definition of corruption to the private sphere since actions that hinder the, up, the hindered hindered to obstruct considerations for what the law would devote, tending to corrupt and ethically unacceptable. Thus, Beggio concern is for perceptions of corrupt behavior that can undermine regimen and state. It would be wrong to interpret Beggio's emphasis on the conditions in which the law operates and individual's character as the only source of corruption in the midst of consolidating what has been attained through the independence and state formation. Rather, what is at play is the systematic relation between society and the individual as well as the values determined these relationships. The ideal that prompted state formation, according to Bejo, was not solely based upon obedience to the law, but rather it demanded that the law would apply to all equally. Although social order does not guarantee equality, social order is the result of individuals' perception of the law, as, quote, the measuring stick of justice and equity that measures everyone. Most importantly, essential variations from the law cannot be allowed to matter how different the conditions of persons, close quote. In other words, the creation of law that secures justice does not ensure that their aims would be reached or that they would apply to all equally. However, Bejo's political and social concerns rest upon the need to impose on the observance of the law a moral and judicial demand that takes into consideration the conditions upon which the law operates, the authority of those in charge of enforcing the law, and most importantly, the stress upon the application of the law to all. We suggest a firm belief in representative government where exclusion is not possible nor for individualism to become the center of political discourse. The emergence of the state is inseparable from the presence of law enforcement since it produces the conditions by which moral decadence is avoided and encroachment on the liberties and freedoms of other individuals prevented. In that regard, Bejo's insistence on a moral observance of the law is an attempt to avert social chaos by deriving a political theory that accentuates the need for an ideal normative framework. The foundation for such structure arises from the effectiveness of the moral in principles whose ultimate aim is to avoid that, quote, the only rule of, rule of action in society is the rule of each individual since it would provoke the disappearance of society, close quote. In other words, the effectiveness of the judicial structures upholding the enforcement of the law produces the foundation for institutional organization within the state while it determines the nature of the social relationship with power. Bejo's analysis highlights the importance of understanding that the basis for governance are the sentiment of obedience, which in turn procures institutional organization. Obedience to the law restrains individuals, leads them to a knowledge of their interests, and most importantly, is the best way to accept that, quote, ensuring the respect of one's own rights is to care religiously about the rights of others, close quote. Such respect begins with those in charge of administering justice, since they are bound not only to observe the law, but to ensure that the law operates in adequate conditions. It is the judge in charge of administering justice who must always demonstrate a just character as representative of the institution's ruling over individual's freedom. In Bejo's words, the individuals in whom this great confidence of nations is deposited cannot be separated from the law in performing their offices. And no matter how powerful the private reasons that tend to oppose the law or the part they relieve it from its letter, all those reasons must be silenced. There is no space in, gov in governability where the private sphere could speak louder than the public in matters of repression. For Bejo's subjection to the law is more important in those charged with administering justice because any decision of the magistrate that departs from the standards created by the law introduces a principle of arbitrariness, which opens the way to corruption and abuse, and ultimately it produces the disruption of the social order. Although for Bejo, the preservation of social order rests upon the limits produced by the law on individuals, freedoms as promoted by democracy, it is the principle of arbitrariness that which causes corruption both on individual's heart as well as on the governability of the state. Thus, nationalism calls for social order based upon the observance of the law and its modes of representation cannot exhaust the equality available to the law. That is, public officials cannot engage in behavior that is technically corrupt. Faced with such strict demands, the state, the supreme government, designates illegal that which undermines the basis on which the authority rests. One might add that the rights of the state depends on the normative standards, testifying to the legality of individual's actions and most importantly, on the force of the law as a source of inspiration of legislation and government. In Bejo's words, quote, without the firm and stern action of the magistrates whose task is to see that they are carried out, 
laws are merely a vain illusion and far from being useful, would preferably not exist. For a disdain for them grows and becomes general. For a disdain for them grows and becomes general, it destroys every principle of morality and decreases the last hopes of improvement. Thus, disrespect for the law produces corruption, which breaks the link between the law and the authority it contains by virtue of being a law, while fracturing the basis on which the law upholds its power through its democratic application. The effects of corruption and democratic governability depend in good part on how much corruption becomes embedded in administrative systems. Bejo's emphasis on the observance of the law deals with the conditions in which the law operates precisely because decentralization of power or, or, or law enforcement does not offer a cure for corruption. Corruption is then, I then if always, in a profound and durable in relation to the forces motivating observance of the law and the conditions in which the law operates. However, for Bejo, the placement of these conditions into the character of the magistrate is an ideological convenience that serves the strengthening of political system that must be in charge of upholding the limits set by, obedience, uh, by being obedient to the law. The extent of our investigation in the corrupt in concept of corruption cannot find in these remarks a simple solution that could rest solely on the creation and development of political structures, social policies, law enforcement, procedures that would prevent the individuals from crossing the boundaries that contrast in social order and the methods by which corruption grows and punished. Corruption is thus framed as emphatically le legal, but we have to ask, what happens when the principle of arbitrariness becomes the norm by which individuals interact? For Bejo, if infractions are committed and, they and these are ignored, the force of the law, the spirit of observance of the law, falls away. And quote, the people become familiar with disobedience and disdain for the law is something looked upon coolly and sometimes even <coughs> with pleasure. Close quote. Disregard for the law, indifference in front of the authority promoted by the law, plays fundamental detrimental roles in democratic governability. It withholds accountability, it does not guarantee the checks and balances needed for exec executive and legislative power, and most importantly, it fractures the institutional framework within which individuals practice their freedom and recognize others. The basic point for, from, from Bejo arguments is that disdain for the law does not produce shame nor concern at times of ad nor concern and at times admiration. The argument that I advance in this essay finds corruption to be more of the way Latin Americans perceive the authority of the, of the law rather than the, source of the rather than the source of the cause of corruption, precisely because corruption delves into delves deeply into ontological foundations of how individuals see themselves as social and civil actors and so better enables to dismantle the solution for corruption through strengthening law enforcement, administering of justice, and rule abdication. On this score, I would argue that the corruption in Latin America is perceived with admirations and sometimes as ability for life because corruption is a response to the principle of arbitrariness, which I have argued early, departs from the equality promoted by democratic governability on the basis of the relationship among individuals and their institutions. That's the second part. Um, do I have still have um, how many? Ten minutes? Yep. Okay. The possibility, this third part is called civic culture. The possibility of locating corruption on other philosophical bases than those that treat corruption as a problem of effectiveness of the judicial structures allow us to understand corruption in the culture where it develops. That is, a culture's view of corruption is the result of the perception that individuals have of the political institutions representing their interests. In that regard, we could easily agree that, the de that democracy in Latin America still fails at representing the interests of the people, which makes the promises of modernity and a misguided project of independence movement and state formation. Even if modernity would ultimately foreground the success of independence as an instantiation of the dominated from a locus that still owe is legitimacy to Eurocentric episteme, there is in Latin America a crisis of political representation that has been compensated by the exaltation of cultural values hindering the possibility for considering a concrete political identity. For Andres Bello, the crisis in political represent representation and identity had an educational antecedent in the formation of a state as early as 1821 in the consolidation of institutions in Chile. Bejo's thinking on the role of education can be understood in the context of a search for means of to eliminate illiteracy in order to make of nationhood a, real, a reality through political participation from all its citizens. Less concerned with identifying and studying corruption as a problem of formal education, the challenge that I envision calls in this last section, of, last section 
for the formulation of political and cultural practices that could end it. In order to escape the predicaments caused by modernist epistemic exopolitics, it is necessary to provide an alternative cultural view of the role of the rule of law. The rule of law here is, an, is essential for understanding the sorts of cultural perception of corruption precisely because the social conditions where the law operates are responsible for the sense of representation individuals will have in their political space. Social conditions can either ensure a sense of being represented within individuals' political space or not and, or not, and perpetuate the deep-seated subjectivity that enables, as Begu has argued, the use of the principle of arbitrariness and the acceptance of corruption. To provide an alternative cultural view of the law means for, for the political space that the law no longer operates as a contract of universal citizenry by promoting a national state as a unified body in which all subjects are granted equal access to membership and simultaneously as their differences be subordinated in order to qualify for membership in the democratic body. Nor can the particular location of culturalized individuals at an intersection where the, con where the con contradictory colonial categories of race social class and economic privilege converge, produce a subject that cannot be determined alongside axes of identity, neither political nor cultural, contained within a single narrative of political formation of the other. If democracy allows for contradiction to exist between culture and politics, insofar as it provides individuals with conflicting sense of belonging to the state, subject will continue to be disenfranchised and excluded from political participation in that state and therefore allow for corruption to become a skill for life. <coughs> state formation had as the ultimate goal the consolidation of a state power through the establishment of democracy. However, there is much to gain in view of the consolidation of state power in terms of Ayn Sussera's concept of concrete universal. Quote, I am not going to confine myself to some narrow particularism, but I don't, I don't intend to either to become lost in disembowel, disembodied universalism. I have a different idea of universal. It is a universal rich with all that is particular, re, re, particular, rich with all that particular there are, the depending of each particular, the coexistence of them alone, at all, close quote. The consolidation of state power in Latin America with its universal republicanism has been one of the greatest exponents of abstract universalism through its attempt to subsume, delete, and assimilate all particularity under the hegemony of modern democracy. To serve from a new locus of enunciation that includes the memories, traditions, sentiments, and a corpo politico they of, of knowledge from a slavery as well as from the political experiences that have resisted polygamism unveils and makes visible wide epistemic that conceals and hidden the abstract universalism that demands the appropriation of cultural particularism that would inevitably result in a provincialism caught up in its own particularity. For Cesare, decolonization must go through a deaffirmation of concrete universalism that welcomes all particulars and not disappropriate the particularity. In that regard, the democracy that Cesare envisioned is one where the concrete universal establish horizontal relationships among particular multiple cosmological and epistemological determinations. <coughs> this understanding of the concrete universal enables to turn this concept against the rule of law in a universal democracy by pointing out that the reduction of, the reduction of law to state power is in itself a lack of possibility of self-governing and a return to a deep-seated subjectivism. In other words, state power has intensified according to the new patterns of accumulation in state courts and is now more than ever a site of the contradictions between individual power and democratic values. Cesare's alternative forms of cultural and political representation shifts our understanding of the terrain of politics itself away from an exclusive focus of the abstract unified subject relations to the state and toward those practices that interstitial sites of cultural formation in which political representation is possible. For Cesare, decolonization should be underway by the affirmation of a concrete universalism that serves as a depository of all particularity where there is no fetishism of power and not by, ch by politics. One of the sites that makes challenging corruption in Latin America politics possible and Cesare's concept of concrete universal of practice is Santana's Mocus political campaign cultural civic, cultural civic culture or cultura ciudadana in the city of Bogota in 1995. 
His political sphere represents a call for multiple civic engagements of citizens for the creation of a political public space where different positions can join each other. Antanas Smokis first used the term civic culture in 1994 while campaigning for le re election as the mayor of Bogota. His philosophical writings have also inaugurated the use of cultural tools that allow the establishment of a dialogue between institutions and communities for the enabling of the development of a civic culture that could sustain long-term long change as a new mode of understanding political practice. Civic culture, cultura ciudadana, can be defined as the set of shared actions and rules that generate a sense of belonging and facilitate political representation which are conducive to respecting common patrimonio to the recognition of all citizens' rights. Mokis, Cultura Ciudadana, aim at changing the cultural context in a way that allowed individuals to find political representation through the understanding of law as a way of self-governance. In fact, at the center of civic culture is Prairie's idea that learning should be linked to everyday life because we learn through, the, through doing things that matter to us. Mokus emphasizes two types of rules that regulate individuals and social behavior. Legal regulations, which are explicit moral rules based on personal background and cultural norms, which are incorporated into collective behavior. However, for Mokus, the major problem, uh, however, for Mokus, quote, the major problem is not the alteration of character, values, or attitudes, but the change of those selected aspects of individual social environments which are relevant to the learning of new behavioral patterns, close quote. In a decolonized and liberated democracy, society governed by a true and sincere concrete universal, cultural norms are the result of a dialogical horizontal process between individuals that are equally related because their subjectivity belongs to a diversity center that has superseded the Eurocentric locus of initiation and no longer act by the logic of exclusion. In other words, morals and law conjoin and reinforce each other. This means that illegal behavior, such as corruption and the, vol and the use of violence, cannot be culturally accepted and even morally justified, which would in turn change the perception of, in this case, corruption from being a skill for individual life as, act, as, act, as an act that hinders the collective process. In setting, pu in setting up publics that are public acts that affect the whole community around a specific types of oppression, Mokis engage in a process of modifying behavior toward cultural change as an outcome of the dialogue between the individual and the group. New structures are established whereby the individual who breaks newly set group rules is publicly shamed. Shame is used as an educational tool with the purpose of achieving cultural change by ridiculing those who are outside the group's action. In social structures where the formal system does not work because of the lack of value attached to the legal system, it is important to create an informal structure where the, bro the group can expose through a set of eth theatrical events individuals who do not accept the new cultural norms and behaviors. During the time of Moku's engagement as major, his theatrical acts had a healing effect on individuals who were offered a symbolic replacement for their own anger and inclination to violence. Well, stars, um, white stars, uh, this is an example, white stars were used as a symbolic object. In 1995, they were painted around the city in the spots where people had killed or died in car accidents. In this way, the city's face was visibly marked to indicate the site where a violent act had been taking place, making these sites into a physical reality relevant. Therefore, a change in the social environment or cultural context had to precede individual change. In this cultural context, political acts perform the unification representation and critically generate the new subject of cultural power. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, um, oh sorry, <laughs> for this uh, beautiful talk that at least to me, brings uh, a lot of uh, reflection about the situation in my country. Uh, because yesterday, when we were talking about the suspension of ethics, yeah, I am. We didn't discuss how this suspension, suspension of ethics, 
is still continuing, right? It's still going on. And I see that that suspension of ethics uh, is behind the huge um, structural injustice that we live in Latin America that uh, uh, affect at the end of the day to the individual, right? I mean, what kind of choices you are, um, you are uh, at your disposal at certain moment? I mean, it's very complex. And then that's the reason why um, it makes a lot of sense to me what um, uh, uh, Ignacio Yacuria says about the fact that a structural injustice, a structural violence, uh, as I we said in Spanish, makes uh, a los individuos malos, a las personas las vuelve malas. Porque, because, you know, um, people are forced to do certain things, not forced, but, you know, what you're talking about. And so I think that that kind of uh, problems affect uh, political action in Latin America. Even the left-wing sector, left sectors, progressive mm -hmm. sectors become embedded into those uh, networks of corruption. We have to talk about that, and I can give you plenty of examples. And now, uh, the I think that um, yesterday when uh, uh, Omar Rivera and Ophelia were talking about uh, the individual, uh, the indigenous traditions, individual, indi indigenous, uh, excuse me, uh, cultural traditions, I was thinking that there are possibilities of uh, finding new ways to uh, counteract these uh, structural uh, lacks of ethics that we are living in our countries, in our countries in Latin America. And I think that we have to discuss more about that because the problem that we are facing now about that, for example, is a huge problem of violence. I mean, I don't know if, um, if uh, I can give you some example in my country, a, a little reflection about what you're talking about, is that I think that your reflection uh, allow us to recover that ethical tradition that we have in the Latin American past. And I can give you one example. is uh, with the case of my country, Guatemala. We had 10 years of wonderful democracies with Juan Jose Arevalo and Jacobo Arben in Guatemala. Ha Juan Jose Arevalo is, is studied in Argentina, sorry, and he was, uh, 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 he received all the influence of the Krautis tradition in Argentina, and he developed a program, a, a political program in Guatemala, a pro political, political program in Guatemala based on the idea of giving dignity to the people. Simple like that. Yeah? But what does that mean in a context of a structural injustice? And so he had a generation of young people who really believe in the possibility of being, of developing those moral virtues, values, yeah? And they were able to develop that, that, that system. What happened in 1954 when they were kicked out of power? And we have the problem with uh, the huge corruption, right? And so what I mean then is uh, at the end of the day that we don't have to, one of the problems that we don't have to forget when we are talking about Latin American philosophy is that problem with the suspension of ethics. Yeah, I, 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 I think I, I disagree with you a little bit because I don't think that there has been a suspension of ethics. There might be other ethics. No, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> and especially when we think about this notion of corruption, this, this notion of corruption is a form of ethics. I mean, people respond to certain values. Maybe um, they're bad, bad ethics. Maybe they are. Um, okay, but okay. But they still function as a way in which we can then judge and we can then um, make judgments about the, you know, the, 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 the actions by which we live our lives. So, so I think that the, the problem that I'm trying to, to pose here, mm -hmm. um, that I hope it came across um, somewhat clear, is precisely that is the perception of the law in the culture, which mm -hmm. is not allowing us to then, um, the way that we perceive corruption as a skill for life is a response um, to that exclusion that's still very much alive and is still very much part of our reality, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the question that I, that, I, that, I, that I pose to myself and I pose to mm -hmm. philosophy as a whole, but especially to American mm -hmm. philosophy, mm -hmm. is, is precisely what do we do about these problems? How do we begin to think through 
waste in which not is just simply a matter of a judicial problem, a problem of enforcing, enforcing the law, but, but most important about the, this cultural perception, um, perception of, of, of corruption. So, okay. so in that sense, um, I think that, you know, and I, and I bring one concrete example that might not be the way in which we every culture or city or um, country in Latin America must, must move, but I think it's an, it's an attempt to, I don't even want, yeah, but to reconcile the, the, the ambivalence that I believe that most of us in Latin America still deal with, which is this both cultural and political ambivalence, right? Because although we, are, we, are, we have a culture that we embrace and a culture that we practice and a set of values that we recognize through our history, we're still very much caught up in this tension between assimilation and, mm -hmm. assimilation and, and resistance. So how much of that assimilation and how much of that resistance begins to play out um, in the everyday polit in the everyday politics, when when it seems like it is exclusion, um, that seems to inform that kind of tension. Yeah. So so I, yeah, I, d I don't think that there has and I you know I I, I was going to discuss this a little bit yesterday when, when we had, but I don't think there has been a, a suspension of ethics. There is mm -hmm. other kinds of ethics, mm -hmm. right? And one that we can call a bad ethic, mm -hmm. right? And that that in itself then promotes and 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 perpetuates. Um, some behavior that we call corruption. Um, but it's a behavior that, that at some point philosophy have not yet been able, I mean, the, the works of the 20 Theses and Poetico of, en of Enrique, in some ways addresses the, the source of, 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 of this yeah. kind of, of fetishism of power, I believe the way that she, she names it. But, but again, um, what do we do with the cultural perception of that specific yeah. skill, which I think in most countries it's great, in, and like I said in the paper, right? Um, people are, see there's certain pride to individuals in Latin America when they said, I was able to, um, to do something bad, right? To, 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 to gain more from what the institution could give me or, or something to that effect, right? I wouldn't draw the, that concept of uh, ethical conscience, uh, at the, that works at the con uh, concrete individual level. I think that's I disagree with you with that conception of ethics, but anyway, we can discuss later. Uh, Omar? Thank you, Orlando, for your paper. Um, I just want to open a door and as, as a suggestion. Um, I think uh, your emphasis in, in perception of corruption that you're, you're bringing up is really interesting to me because, and also saying that there's a way in which we praise um, corruption that means that we enjoy to perceive it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be a, a matter of, for lack of a better word, aesthetics. That there might be a problem with Latin American, not a problem, but, but, but some tensions and some, some, something that needs to be resolved or understood about Latin American aesthetics and civility. And I'm thinking about then, uh, art and the power that art may have to precisely address the things that you are bringing up. Um, and I can think of Latin American works of art mm -hmm. that, that are constitutive of a sense of, of citizenship, uh, uh, like the, maybe Diego Rivera and the murals of Diego Rivera and so forth, and there are other examples. So I, that's yes, the, wor the, the door that I wanted to open is that when, when you enter the, the, the space of perception, maybe there's, there's a question of of aesthetics there. Right, I, I think that there's definitely a question of aesthetics, but again, that um, there is all kinds of art in, of course, in any given um, culture or continent or and, and space, but, but I think that still the, the notion of art in, in some of our countries still is cut up in this kind of way in which it's something that only belongs to those that have access to the art and the perception of certain standards of what we consider to be art, right? There's, there are strains of art that are right, different yeah. than that. So the yeah. reason I, I brought, I brought yeah. the work of Antonio Mocos is because maybe theater is a way of yes. art or so it's yes. a word of expression that kind of aesthetic yes. kind of values that yes. maybe we don't have access in political space. Correct. Which I think that in, sen in the sense we will cease to or will we'll provide other tools by which we can then perceive corruption differently. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so I definitely believe that there is some kind of a aesthetic work that needs to be done or that can, can begin to be integrated within the way that we understand politics. Yeah. Um, that will be very, very interesting. Eduardo? Um, it, is your assumption that the problem of corruption is a distinctly Latin American problem? No. 
or so what? Why are you? Uh, what is the source? What is the itch that you're scratching? I'm, I'm trying because, to <laughs> because it seems to me that <laughs> there is also a lot of corruption in the United States. Yes, of course. And there's corruption in Africa. Yeah. So th on that, that on the one hand, and then um, I'm fascinated by the way in which you, for instance, rescued uh, Andres Bello. But on, on the other hand, there's the whole um, history of the state in Latin America that is being hobbled by the question of colonialism and then imperialism, dictatorships. And so there has been a distance between uh, the constitution of citizenry and the, and the state, which I, I don't think figure in your analysis. So I'm, I'm really puzzled by, by yeah, w what are you um, getting at? Because What's the point? W well, no, in the <laughs> sense of why do you want to focus on the question of corruption um, in, in Latin America? Why not say corruption in Colombia or corruption in Mexico? Because on the other hand, we have the, the rise of left-wing states in Venezuela, in Bolivia, where we have a real uh, shift in this notion of citizenry, where people are actually engaged and involved in the process of um, you know, juridication and you know, ho holding uh, po politicians accountable to uh, political mandates and so on and so forth. So I, I was just puzzled by the unspoken assumption that this might be a distinctly Latin American phenomena um, as opposed to uh, you know, a general problem of political states, nation states. So, um, I, I think that it's. A, I mean, I, I think I mentioned in my paper that that corruption, of, of course, within any given, any given political system, right? But I'm, I'm very concerned with the way that Latin America perceives corruption, and what I'm trying to say is that in 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 Latin America, and maybe, um, I, yeah, in Latin America, corruption is perceived as a skill for life. What that means is that. Um, you need to be corrupt in order to make it in the in the real world. Um, it's, 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 it's an attitude that that I, I think I've seen among not only in Colombia, but you know, well, talking to other people to, to and, and going to different countries, is is this kind of this attitude that simply com says if if I do something, there must be some kind of an interest to me. If if I have a, a, a some kind of a business, there is something that I I need to gain from that, right? So, so, and, thi and this corruption is seen by, by the collective as something to be praised. So there, there is a certain, certain kind of pride and, and, and I think that Andres Bello called it a coolie attitude, right? Of, of, of it is okay to be corrupted, it, to be corrupt. So in, in, some, in the sense that, that, um, that it has even become a normal, a norm by which we actually live our lives. Um, and I think that that's, that's it's, 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 it's being, it's, it's not originally, but, it, but it's, a, it's a problem of Latin America because culturally we accept these kinds of things. And we accept them because we benefit indirectly or directly to having a corrupted kind of system from all levels, right? So it's not, it's not simply that the, law, the laws are not there, it's not simply that law enforcement is not there, it's even the way that we perceive how the law operates in relationship to corruption. Um, and these have, I mean, these have very particular responses and context in different countries in Latin America, but I would say that, for example, law enforcement in, Col in, in, in Latin America, we still, see the, we still see the policeman as someone that is from a lower class. We still see the policeman as someone that ha does not have the same education to those of us, in front of those of us that have a, a better social status and so on and so forth. So there is always this, this, this possibility of, 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 of um, uh, deviating from the established order, whatever that established order is. And I, I'm saying that that deviation is in itself a skill that now um, it, it's, been, it's been accepted by, by the culture in which, in, which we, in which we interact. So um, the reason I bring Andres Bello is because I think, I think that Andres Bello is, is trying to differentiate between what the culture can do and what, poli and what the political space can do. And I think that he's clear that um, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, by no means I'm trying to say that here that the, 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 the notion of law and the obedience to the law um, is something that simply operates as a way of establishing social order. But I think that, that I want to get rid of that part that simply says it's just simply a matter of law enforcement and a, law, a, law, a matter of applying the law. I think that is a cultural aspect in the way that we perceive corruption 
that have not we have not yet deal in terms of how is that philosophy of Latin American philosophy can begin to address that kind of problem. So so um, so yeah, that's that's precisely what I'm doing. I don't know if that that if that well responds to I your I problem. I still think uh, just very briefly. I I, I still would challenge that assumption. That I mean that, that, I mean that, that and, and that's the p that's the that's the I mean that that's precisely the reason I brought the theme because it needs to be challenged, uh, but it can't be dismissed. We cannot ignore that this, this this phenomena occurs in most Latin American countries. So so we can we can challenge the way that that I maybe am presenting, but we cannot challenge the fact that it has become part of our reality and that that and it's an attitude that that we praise um, from all social classes and from all. Um, Yeah, uh, uh, just just as a clarification, I, I want to get this straight. Are you are you speaking about the question of corruption that may happen in other places and is not particular to Latin America, or are you saying that this is a particular problem with Latin America? Because uh, I'm very much with Eduardo here, and the fact is that when you were speaking, I was thinking about my 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 Italian friend Piero, who says exactly the same thing about Bel the Berlusconi culture in Italy. And you were really describing the Berlusconi culture in Italy and the way Italians see the fact that the best Italians are the ones that get away with crime. So, so, uh, so I'm much with Eduardo. So it seems to me that the uh, at least I get the impression that there would have to be a differentiation made, maybe about particularly in Latin America, the way in which that happens. But uh, I'm, I'm not. Anyways, just as an aside. Um, but Rhea, as I said. Um, thank you for your paper. Um, I wonder if the conversation changes a little bit if we think about corruption alongside this concept of governability that got brought up, I think, particularly in your second part. I think this changes radically if we think about corruption as a part of the overall trajectory of both colonialism and post-colonialism, because it's been used as such a justification for colonialism. And then even right now, if we go to the United Nations website, for example, we can look and see that certain nations, particularly in the global south, are still being deemed as, well, they have a corrupt government, and they have a corrupt this, and they have a corrupt that, even though, you know, the, the hugest financial institutions of the West are completely corrupt and have been the locus of the downfall for so many individuals' like lives. But this kind of corruption is taken up as a more natural artifact of certain countries or just the way that it is, it seems to be it's more endemic problem to some countries rather than other. And so I wonder if we read um, what you're talking about, the cultural acceptance or, um, uh, or how, did, how you phrase that, the, you know, you have to live by corruption or, you know, that acceptance. I wonder if we read it in the context of a larger history of being told over and over, well, you, it just is corrupt. Your institutions just are corrupt if that necessarily changes the appreciation of what the cultural artifact is, um, rather than to say, I, I just think that it would radically shift the analysis if we look at it, not just as something that has come up with the issue of legality, but something that has come up because of hundreds of years of being colonized in a certain way, and then uh, you know, years and years of post-coloniality, with liberal institutions saying, well, we want to help you because you're just so corrupt. You know, you just can't get it together. And so I think if we look at it in that light, because um, I, I hear you and I don't, you know, my, my uncle just got back from India and the only thing he kept talking about was how corrupt everything was and how, but how people had to do it. it. You know, the police were corrupt and the only way to pay your property taxes was through a corrupt this and corrupt that. So I, I think that it, it would just be, make a lot, um, I just think it would change the analysis quite radically if we looked at it in, in that kind of context. And I would like to know your thoughts. Yes, and, and, and thank you for, um, for, for providing the, the, the need or like pushing the, the, the idea to really aim at something that um, makes it specifically of, of, of not of Latin America, but maybe of colonial kind of. Um, and I thought that by using the notion of exclusion as a residue of exclusion that's still very much present um, in this democratic governab governability will will make the point but I think that um, maybe more emphasis on that will um, will shift corruption to that specific experience of, of the colonial experience so um, I have a question and there is time so I'm not robbing anyone of time uh, um, 
I am wondering, I, I heard you to suggest that the emphasis on coloniality and a larger sense of history would not be sufficient to respond to an internal problem that is a culture that is specific to places. So I thought that when your first question was went to that too, which is if we keep talking about coloniality and decoloniality and, f and theories, we're still not addressing <coughs> internal problems that cannot be addressed simply by recognizing those structures. Is that fair to say? Is that what that you're saying? That is fair to say. Okay. And I think that, that in that sense there is a, there is a shortage of how much um, Latin American philosophy and philosophy of, of, of like the postcolonial discourse have, have attempted to um, really engage with certain narratives where these very specific problems seem to occur, which um, they can even aim at those, right? They can recognize those, but I don't think that there is yet a, a space for those kinds of, of narratives. Um, on the contrary, I think that the, the tendency sometimes is to appropriate of those kinds of experiences and to use those as a platform from where they can, uh, I can theorize certain things. Uh, Ophelia? Um, I am in the spirit of Eduardo, Andrea, and Alex, so I'm going to try to phrase it like this. Um, it's my understanding from having watched the development of Latin American studies over many, many years that one of the shifts that took place at the advent of neoliberalism was that the neoliberal programs started charging that the, the problems with Latin American economies uh, were due to internal corruption of, those, of all those particular states. And this is because I have asked some of my friends who are in, um, you know, who are economists uh, specifically, how did it come about that um, dependency theory was knocked out of the, you know, analysis of the, of the, the, the economic problems of Latin America? Because there was a period of time can recall that you know dependency theory was extremely important, and it was seen as an original you know contribution of um, Latin American economists and social theorists to the analysis of why we have such widespread poverty in this part of the world and peripheral capitalism. So what happens is that with the advent of neoliberalism, and you know all of that analysis of of um, dependency theory had to go by the side. Um, the shift, you know, in the discourse of ne neoliberalism was precisely to talk about corruption and to blame uh, internal problems in Latin American countries for the fact that they could not develop properly in a, you know, in the sort of capitalist way that was planned for the entire hemisphere. So I think that regardless of the fact that indeed there are many corrupt practices and probably structures of corruption, as others, as, as you acknowledge and others have pointed out, but these exist all over the world, I think we have to be very, very, very careful when if we are thinking that we're going to take a leftist position or a, a you know, decolonial analysis of uh, any topic, when we engage with the topic of corruption, we have to be extremely careful because this is precisely the, precisely the subject that the other side is throwing at us as we are being, you know, culturally stereotyped through drugs, gang violence, all these things, as, you know, a culture of corruption. And they blame the fact that we cannot advance economically or we cannot, also the discourse of the rule of law. This is in the Washington consensus. This is part of the United States idea of how everybody ought to behave throughout the world. So as soon as you start invoking this rhetoric of um, the rule of law, you know, again, you have to be extremely, extremely careful because these are exactly the phrases and the terminologies that are being used to make sure that, you know, everybody conforms to sort of like neoliberal patterns. And so the same with uh, terms like democracy and so on. So I just want to say, just be, w I, I think it's okay to go ahead with the analysis of corruption or whatever, but I think we have to be extremely careful and not engage in some sort of collective guilt trip here. Um, the <laughs> other part is that in the analysis of Andres Bello, you know, I think that even as you, this is some sort of bourgeois conception of law, and as far as I can see, it's male dominated because the rights of others 
at that time, women didn't even have any rights to vote or anything of any kind of political representation. Legal representation was probably very, very subordinate. I don't know the, the exact terms. But to, to engage in a discourse of this and to, to even talk about the rights of others, uh, even th though later you're going to criticize the GSSR, you know, it seems to me that, you know, these points have to come out there because every time we talk about the rights of others, we have to have a further question. In whose terms are the rights of others being defined? So, um, and that in that that's an, a, a real political question. So I, I just want to end it there and, and, and also uh, stress that the desired governability is precisely one of the categories that post-colonial feminism uses and subaltern studies use to try to figure out who was a subaltern and who was not. And I think that this discussion, you know, brings this out very well. And so we have to pay quite a bit of uh, attention to, you know, where is the discourse located? What if we're committed intellectuals and we want, you know, better societies that work for everybody and, and things like that and where, you know, certain bad practices can be eliminated and so on. Do we have to be really, really careful about um, how we understand the politics of this whole discussion? Uh, would, would, I mean, I, I, I agree with you and I think that there is, of course, a, a lot of more work to do with this, but could, could you give me an, one specific example when you said I need to be more careful in how to move through, through that um, understanding of the problem of corruption? I, the second part of your question, I think that is that is still very much something that the discourse of Latin America needs to engage, which is what we mean exactly we mean by the other. But when you, when you speak about how, how to best approach the notion of corruption with, with such um, precision or being careful, um, wh what would be the, the something that would contribute to then engaging in, in understanding corruption as something that belongs to Latin America without falling back into that kind of a stereotype that you talked about in regards to only um, that the right is the one that is pure and the one that is moral and ethical while the left is one that has more tendency to be uh, corrupt and populist and so on and so forth. Um, because uh, and the reason I ask you, I, I ask you that is because um, I, I, I mean, I, I, of course, I didn't see that as, as a, I, mean I, I didn't see it. I would maybe I didn't uh, I definitely did not speak about it in my paper. But but if you can maybe help me, literally, uh, a way that I can then be begin to to think how is that this left right uh, precision can be um, acquired through morality? Then I would really really. Uh, you know, I, as I said, sometimes I speak and people think I'm a depository of wisdom. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a depository of wisdom. But uh, um, I, I think Eduardo had a point there about trying to be very case specific. Um, and I, you know, I know, you know, if, if I had to talk about Cuba, but I, you know, there's a black market that has coexisted entirely with uh, with a socialist economy. And, you know, I don't know whether people want to call that corruption or not. This is the other part. Like, I, this is like what everybody stole from the state because everybody, I'm, I'm almost like with the state's compliance. But I mean, because everybody thought, oh, I got a bad deal. I don't have enough to get through my ration book or whatever. So they took a little bit from from here, a little bit from there. And it was totally socially accepted. It was a completely socially accepted practice. And now there's a government that is trying to to try to stop that to a certain extent and is, is feeling like they have to make some economic reforms and they have to cut, cut some of this practice out. And I think it's, it's very difficult because, you know, there's been a, 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 a habit of <laughs> developed over the years where this was totally accepted as a way of survival. And so I think this is a very complicated thing and and, um, and um, it deals, I think you have to talk about social injustice in general and the plight of some of these, you know, people who, who don't get enough of a chance. And uh, I don't think, I think maybe taking a less moral con conception of um, corruption, so sort, <laughs> sort of looking at as a, more of a social social phenomenon without looking uh, without making a, a judgment of normative judgment about it, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I I don't know I'm sure other people here have a lot of better ideas than I, but I think it has to be very case specific. The most important thing is to say to make to defend your 
your culture first <laughs> and and realize that you know um this is a this is a discourse that has been used to disempower Latin American emancipatory you know projects um, of a non capitalist sort. Let's say uh, we have time for one more comment and question, uh, Enrique. <coughs> yes, that is an uh, interesting theme of conversation. Uh, like said Eduardo, I agree. There is two special corrupt countries as such in Latin America. The first is Mexico and the second is Colombia. But when I begin my 20 thesis on politics, that was a course for, for more than 400 politicians and in, in 20 sessions, 20 weeks. And the first thesis, if you read it's a small book, is the question of corruption. Yep. But the corruption is the effect, not the cause. And it's necessary to understand the effect of what. And more than that, what is corruption, philosophically speaking? Because accumulate wealth or steal money is one effect of corruption. The sexual harassment is a type of corruption. And I made a description of seven, ty uh, seven types of corrupt acts. <coughs> but what is the essence of corruption? Hitler can be corrupt without steel and without any sexual harassment and can be corrupt Hitler as such. For me, corruption is the, I will say abstractly and after explaining in two words, is the self-referentiality of the exercise of power in the will of the representative. That means, the power has only a subject, the political community. And the community can say, we exert the power in their own name. But the representative, that I call protestas, exerts the power in the name of people. Is the reference of the exerc is a, a delegation. When the will of the representative is self-referential, Marx, in an article in 1842, he said the diet, the diet, the Congress of Westphalen is corrupt because it's fetishist, because the will of the government or the governor is put as the foundational moment of the exercise of power. When the, the representative has the joy to exercise the power in their own name, not in the name of power, that's it, the corruption. And perhaps don't steal any money and don't, don't exert any unjust act, but this fruition of the exercise of the power of my will, that is the corruption. And not as the obedience to the people and servant to the people and delegation of people. If you uh, go deeper in this level, you begin to understand what means corruption. When a person has a own project in the exercise of power and not as the service to the people can be take as the complice of many things. For example, the drug can say, uh, do you want to be rich? We give you men to t uh, million dollars to, to your account in the bank. And because I don't think in the service to the people, but I, I fetishize my will, I accept the money. The question is, think what is corruption? Is a cultural 
political type of exercise of power. And that is, uh, is even in the school, because in Mexico has uh, 80 years of exercise of corrupt type of uh, power. But Lula, for example, has not this attitude, or Evo Morales, or Cristina Fernandez, or all these people are one conception of power that didn't allow to be complice of this type of temptations. So, so the question is go deeper right. in, yeah. the, in the question. And second, the question is who temptate or who offer money? The offer money, the drug people, or the transnational corporations, or who give this money and use the corrupt subjectivity of the representative as complice of some goals, and these goals are the dependent capitalism, the coloniality, and that is the cost, not the, 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 the corruption. The corruption is one effect, secondary effect, of other causes more essential, uh, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, do I have time to, um, yeah. So, so I, I mean, I, I, you know, when I read your, um, your book on the 20 pieces of, of politics, I know that you, you address this, this problem and that you begin your first thesis, as I mentioned in my paper, is indeed a way to say this is what corruption is and how this is how you, you see it as a, poli as a problem of political representation. What, I, what I'm trying to do in my paper um, that I hope I was, maybe I was not that, that clear, is that I'm, I'm very concerned with the way that we perceive culturally the notion of corruption and how it has become and a skill, especially in Colombia and, in, and, and in, in, in Mexico, but I think in the, in the everyday life, uh, to the point that it's just something that is acceptable. It's something that becomes like a, like, a, like a moral norm by which we can then operate, both politically and culturally, in relation with each other and in relationship with the affairs and the institutions that we have within that given, given state. But Right, that, that's, that's the critique that, yeah. Ex ex but but I don't I don't but I think that in the colonial as as someone said in the back maybe the colonial residue of 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 of, of, a, of a not fully a decolonial kind of discourse have not yet been able to deal with that kind of, of residue of, of of exclusivity and, and, and inequality that seems to prompt this kind of attitude precisely to uh, the effects of corruption that you're talking about. Join me in thanking Hernando. Thank you.